Welcome back to another October edition of Beer Time with Books. Another? Did we record the last episode in October? Yeah, that's why we we had. Have we recorded it in October? Yeah, the spooky season beer. That's what it was all about. What spooky season? Bat Squatch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Was it like October 1st? I think it was. (laughs) Yeah, it was a very early early October. Yeah, tentative October episode, or tentative, it was uh, barely an October episode. I was just prepared for this book to be our spooky season book, so I wasn't thinking about Omen Setters. <laughs> it's true. Today's uh, today's book is definitely some spooky season material. We're looking at the first half of The Master and Margarita, but we got a couple things to hit before then, including a little bit, uh, again, of some thematic drink options yeah so we can go ahead and hit those real quick on the what are you drinking section would anyone like to start i'll start hit us off hey guys this is danny um i'm drinking a bermuda locket new england ipa from fury brewing company in north huntington pennsylvania uh I did an event for work uh, last week, and the sales rep that I worked with sent me a six-pack of beer from the brewery that they featured at the event. So that's why I'm drinking an IPA from Pennsylvania. Yeah, (laughs) Pennsylvania is definitely, I think that may be a first. I don't know if we've ever had a Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvania beer on beer time with books so we'll be featuring that looks like some mermaid material for yeah i don't i don't know instagram what. <laughs> bermuda locket check out our gram for uh <laughs> for the um the label the mermaid label uh that's beer time with books on instagram been plugging it for a look at those cans <laughs> <laughs> hashtag look at those cans. <laughs> uh jamie you want to go next sure Hi, uh, this is Jamie. Currently, I am drinking uh, a white wit style ale from Alaskan Brewing Co., um, which I started during dinner. So it's almost gone. Once I'm done with that, I have on standby uh, a, a thematic <laughs> brew that Brian bought specifically for the pod today. That is also a Belgian style white ale, but it's the White Rascal from Avery Brewing in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and Brian bought it because the can has a little devil on it, which relates to the subject of our book today. Yeah, we'll get deeper into that in a little bit. And uh, for me, this is Brian. I've never done this on the podcast before but this is some russian lit and i'm looking to get russian lit for this episode (laughs) so i have uh half a shot of 360 vodka uh to start off for this section you really saved that for the pod (laughs) i wasn't prepared for that one (laughs) and uh, i'm also after taking that shot i'll be cracking open uh, the Avery Brewing White Rascal as well with that devil can uh, because this is a bit of a devilish episode. White, so looking forward. White Rascal made the, it. Um, adjectives that they put on the side of this can are authentic, zesty, mischief. M- mischief. <laughs> White Rascal has made an appearance before. I drank that in season one. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that has definitely been on before. And that was pre-Instagram. So I guess this will be the first time to actually get a look at it. I didn't so. get featured on the gram. <laughs> Instagram didn't exist. Yeah, pre-Instagram. <laughs> it's total To existence. be clear, it was 2007. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a long-running podcast. Uh, so, yeah, with that, uh, we're going to be moving into uh, the next section here, which is some recent media and we're going to hit into uh, a couple highlights from the last couple of weeks because it's been pretty recent since our latest episode. So uh, just a couple highlights since last time uh, that you've been enjoying this October. Dan, you want to start for this one as well? I got you. Um, 
I uh, have been watching Ratch- Nurse Ratchet. Ratchet, I think is it's just called, on Netflix. Um, it's like an eight episode, I think, um, features Sarah Paulson. And it's um, about, it f- focuses on the character of Nurse Ratchet from One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. And it's just like... Your favorite book. <laughs> what? <laughs> favorite book. <laughs> it grew... Now, I look back on it more fondly, I think, now than I was feeling for it when I was reading it. Um, but it, it's a really interesting, like, retelling uh, or, like, you know, look into her backstory. And I also love Sarah Paulson. She's phenomenal. And so it's very American Horror Story-esque, a very American Horror Story vibe, uh, just in time for spooky season. I love the... Um, Sanit- sanator- sanatorium? Sanitarium? Mm-hmm. I don't remember mm-hmm. which one that is. One of those. One of those <laughs> uh, vibes, the asylum vibes. And um, yeah, it's, I'm about six episodes in and it's pretty spooky. I can only handle like one at a time. Um, so I've been, I've been really liking that. Will has been watching from the kitchen table uh, while doing other things. So he's been half watching with me, but it's mostly just me. He's not that interested. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel like all the streaming services have really been going hard on these uh, literature-based shows and now spinoffs to some degree, which is interesting. I mean, if they're good, I'm happy to see them keep coming. It's good. It's it's pretty outrageous in the way that, like, American Horror Story is. It's, um, it's like, less sort of, I don't know, cinematic and more, like, just very dramatic, almost like sometimes sounds and looks like a horror movie from the 80s. Um, so it's great. I'm enjoying it. Um, and, uh, I've also been reading, I have been slogging my way through all the King's men who has made, you know, which is, which has made a feature on this podcast before I will say, yes, I was reading that over the summer. I think that was like early quarantine read for me. Yeah. So I started it, I started it around the same time or maybe in the middle of you reading it, but then I, uh, had to return it to the library and then I got it on my Kindle and then I had to return that copy and then I got the library copy again. So now <laughs> it's been several months and it took me 200 pages to like really get into a groove, but I started assigning myself 25 pages a day, so I should be good. <laughs> well, not only is it spooky season, it is uh, politics season it as is well, which is season. its it's its own spooky season to some degree, but yeah, that's definitely a great political novel, so that's cool. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I'm enjoying it now. Yeah. Jamie? Um, I, since the last episode, listened to an audiobook, uh, also related to spooky season. Um, I don't ever read horror, like, at all. I've, I've even tried to read Stephen King in the past and just, like, couldn't get into it, but... Uh, somebody that I follow on Twitter had a whole thread about scariest books they've read, and this was on there. Uh, she specifically said this was the one that was the scariest out of all the books she's read. Uh, it's called I Remember You, and it's by an Icelandic author, and I would try to pronounce her name, but it has like 20 letters in it, um, and I don't. Her first name is Ursa. I can't say her last name. I don't I don't know what it is. Um, even like I listen to the audiobook and they say the author's name and I still couldn't <laughs> repeat it for you. Like I don't know what it is. But it's set in Iceland and it was a a ghost story um following like two stories throughout the whole thing, like every other chapter. Um one story about some friends renovating an old house in like a pretty abandoned seaside town in Iceland and then another about the investigation of an old woman's suicide told mostly from the perspective of a doctor who like examined her body after she was found um and it was really really scary very spooky I couldn't listen to it at night um (laughs) I really like genuinely got scared there's a in the book the group of friends that's renovating the house they have a dog and this is kind of a cliche I know but the dog like starts growling or barking whenever there's about to be something very scary with the the child ghost that's running around and one morning I have to take our dog out like at five in the morning before I leave for work and one morning I took him out there 
after having listened to part of this book and he immediately started growling when we went outside absolutely and I was like, not what the fuck is happening <laughs> <laughs> I was no like, oh my god um but it was very scary i do recommend it i i was enthralled and it had a lot of twists and turns at the end so uh yeah that's my recent media cool uh and then for me been watching a couple kind of cult classics from the 90s one of them uh i i picked for jamie and i to watch because i thought it was going to be a bit more eerie than it was uh and it still definitely has an eerie side but it was way more goofy um than i had originally anticipated but it's a uh, twin peaks uh david lynch's uh, show from the the 90s and I thought I had seen some scenes from it in the past and we've already seen some of those scenes that um, had popped up on my timeline on various social medias before and they're definitely unsettling but overall like I found myself laughing a lot during the show just because it's so melodramatic it's so goofy um, and it's you know something that was kind of interesting to think about it being on one of the major broadcast networks. I believe it was on ABC uh, back in the nineties, but we're pretty much halfway through season one right now. And it's, it's actually been pretty good. I, I wasn't fully drawn in cause I had to get used to the style, but now that I am more used to it, um, it's, it's been kind of interesting. So I, I'm curious to see where that goes. And then I've also been, diving into some anime recently because I feel like this has happened <laughs> to me multiple times around October where I just kind of uh, dive back into a couple series I haven't seen before. I'm not like a uh, you know, major fan of like anime overall, but there are a few that are some of my favorite shows of all time. But I decided to start watching Cowboy Bebop is <laughs> what it's called, which again is kind of uh, a classic from the 90s, but for anybody familiar with like Toonami on Cartoon Network, this was the first anime Toonami showed. Um, and it's really short, it's only 26 episodes, but uh, just an interesting story of the solar system in 2071. Uh, and humans have col colonized a lot of the various planets and it follows the Bebop spaceship and the bounty hunters that are aboard uh, said ship. And it's just kind of like, a very chill, hip anime jazz soundtrack. Um, it's just not as over the top as uh, I'm used to with a lot of anime, and I kind of like the understated tone quite a bit. So that's been an interesting watch, and there's a few other uh, shows that are in my back pocket um, to continue watching anyway. But those have been kind of fun to get into um, after <laughs> having a stint with reality TV, as we had <laughs> talked about last episode. So... Uh, with that, now that we've hit uh, all of our corners, it's time for our new corner, Erotic, erotic Corner. corner. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That was uh, for anybody that is unaware of Erotic Corner. That <laughs> that's deep into our last episode. I'm in Setter's <laughs> Luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you won't you won't understand this Erotic Corner unless you go back and listen to the last <laughs> yeah, Erotic Corner. Yeah, it's a serialized <laughs> corner of of this show. I wasn't prepared. Uh, for find it on our corner. Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Erotic Corners. You gotta you gotta go into our Patreon and. Or our OnlyFans. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Subscribe to our OnlyFans. For, uh, for our add beer time with books, not just, just for kidding, our just five kidding. minutes of erotic. <laughs> I don't know erotic what content. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> we're not doing erotic corner, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but what we are doing is we're getting into the sixth book of our second season. For anybody that is. Listening to this semi real time, I don't know how many people are trying to just like read along as we do, which we apologize for huge breaks in episodes <laughs> if that's the case. Or um, you're welcome for all of the time to read the books. <laughs> right, right. Um, but hopefully we can finish season two by the end of the year. And it seems like we're all pretty uh, into this book so far. So we may be making a return sooner rather than later. But with all of that being said, we're going to move into The Master and Margarita and just get a. Uh, Quick start with a summary from Jamie. Woo. Yes. 
Um, I genuinely, every single time I'm the like host, the leader of a pod of this podcast, I forget that I have to do a summary until the last minute. Um, <laughs> you but, can you can do what we like had been doing recently, oh, just quicker, like yeah, quick summary, just broader highlights to just kind of set the table. So. The devil went down to Moscow. Um, <laughs> All right, get that fiddle out. <laughs> um, so sorry. That's my summary. No. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. All right, moving on. Um, okay, but basic basic plotline. Uh, we open up to two literary figures in Russia in. Moscow having a conversation about a um, a book or an article that one of them is trying to write about Jesus. Uh, a man interrupts and says, "Oh, Jesus! <laughs> oh, Jesus! Oh, I know about him." Uh, <laughs> and we we slowly learn that this man is the devil. He goes by the name Woland. He kind of says he's a professor of like <laughs> dark magic or some black magic. Um. And he tells them a story about Pontius Pilate and says that he he knew him and he was there when uh, he sentenced Jesus to death and all these different things. Um, in this conversation, uh, he predicts the death of the editor, uh, Berlioz. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, who yeah, then, please, please forgive us for all yeah, of these it's, names. I'm not going to say anything, right? I tried to look up pronunciations and I it didn't go well. Um, who, anyway, barely Oz subsequently dies. He gets ran over by a streetcar, beheaded, and that is sort of the thread that follows us throughout the rest of at least the first part. Um, his friend, Bezdomni, or... Um, Ivan is he Ivan? I think he's Ivan. Yeah. Ivan. Yeah, he's the um, poet. one of many. Yeah, so yeah, many Ivans. <laughs> <laughs> um, he kind of is like slowly going crazy, even though all of this stuff really happened. He's running around trying to get somebody to listen to him about this crazy professor, and nobody will. And he ends up in an insane asylum, and um, basically just absolute chaos in Moscow because of the devil. Um, We'll get into lots of details about that, I'm sure, but that's that's a general start, at least. Um, we also meet the the titular character, the master, towards the end of the first part, um, who is in the insane asylum where Ivan ends up. Um, but that's that's mostly <laughs> where we're at. Is that an okay? Yeah. Quick summary. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. it's also probably worth noting that, like. Um, that Bulgakov um, couldn't pub- like this was published posthumously because mm-hmm. he couldn't publish it. He was writing about like the like oppression basically under like Soviet rule and like wasn't able to publish it or like reap any of the sort of like under like you know understand how influential it was until ever <laughs> because he died <laughs> before it was published. <laughs> yeah, his wife was the person who um, pushed for the publication. Um, So it was being written in like the 30s-ish and was published in the 1960s. And Um, he he died in 1940, just for even mm -hmm. further clarification on all of that. So like, and from what our copy of the book says, it was even censored upon that publication in the 60s. And it took even later than that to get uncensored, fully translation, anything like that. Some translations, I mean, we talked, like Jamie and I talked about this a little bit um, off the pod. Um, but, you know, we have, I think we we have different translations of the book, but also even some translations, like, are still, uh, some of the earlier translations are still sort of censored in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they uh, were as based off of, ones. like, the Soviet published censored material. So, reader beware, as we've kind of talked about, we're assuming you've probably read the book if you're listening to this podcast, but maybe the copy you have uh, is one of these censored ones. Might be worth looking into. Yeah, speaking of, I think it is maybe important for because there are a lot of very passionate people about uh, the different translations. Um, so I'm just going to say Brian and I are both reading um, an edition that was translated by uh, Diana Bergen and Catherine Tiernan O'Connor, um, which from what I read online, a lot of people think that this is a good translation. That is why I bought it. Um, it's one of the more 
approved translations. Um, Danny, which one do you have? Interesting. This is the one I could get from the library, which is translated by Michael Glennie. Uh, it was published in 1992 in an everyman's library um, like group. Um, yeah, that's all I can get from the first page. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, cool. Well, speaking of Danny, you mentioned that it... Uh, wasn't able to be published because of the criticisms of the of Soviet life in the early 1900s. That was actually where I wanted to start because Brian um, and I both mentioned while we were reading at least the first half of this first part that we didn't fully understand what was being criticized. Like there's so much nonsense happening. So I just wanted to start with that of like, now that we're all the way through the first part, what criticisms did we pick up on do we understand that layer of the text um how is soviet life being portrayed in your opinion yes so i have a few thoughts on this because i i picked up on no criticisms really i don't know anything about russia or russian society in the 30s so (laughs) So, uh, so very brave. <laughs> so I know uh, nothing me... about Russia. Is it a country? Where is it? I let me finish. So <laughs> I, so on my like first read, I was basically just like, I, before I had like read any sort of analysis or like looked into it really, I, I really didn't pick on pick up on that much, um, except for the on- the only thing that really occurred to me was. Um, you know that when he was writing this, he I'm sure was trying to get away with critic with criticism, and like you know was trying to like work around what he was actually allowed to write about. Um, and you know in that like he public or he wrote um, you know the story of Jesus Jesus is like crucifixion and Pontius Pilate, um, sort of like f- from a different view than like it is published in the Bible. Um, you know like sort of from a di- in a different way than a lot of people talk about what like at least the Catholics call the passion of Jesus Christ. Like when he is sentenced and crucified, like it's not normally told from Pontius Pilate's viewpoint. So this story that is included like right at the beginning um, to me, I mean, I couldn't, I can't pick out anything super specific, but to me, like there were parts of it, you know, with, with Pilate's ruling and then like the, basically like the committee that decides which of the three or which of the four, criminals is going gets you know gets um to go free um all of that sort of reminded me like you know made me think that maybe Bulgakov was like trying to draw parallels between um like the the Soviet Union's government and like maybe like the ruling committee um and Pontius Pilate at that time like during Jesus's time and the only way he was allowed to sort of critique or write about how ridiculous it sounds is by like basically you know writing about the story of Jesus um like it was just like a story. Um, so that was like something that I read a little bit about, but occurred to me uh, only after like I finished pretty much the first book. Um, but um, the only other thing is uh, he talks about, um, oh, I'm you might have to come back to me. I don't remember. I wrote it down. Brian, you go. Yeah, I think definitely at the beginning, especially when we get thrown so much into the story of Pontius Pilate, you know, we get this entire chapter so early on going back to that time period, just a completely, you know, out of the blue whiplash moment uh, that it wasn't easy for me to pick up on. But I'd say definitely once it started getting into uh, the apartment scene where they started talking about the disappearances is when it started to be like, okay, just because just from, you know, cursory knowledge about the Soviet union and, and certain aspects of, of society at the, that time, it, it was like, okay, this is making some sense that this is getting brought up in such a way that, you know, is kind of a common occurrence, but the way it was written wasn't like, necessarily some dwelled upon like 
huge horror. It was just kind of like this supernatural thing, which I thought was like a really interesting way to write it, especially with the context of its censorship and reading a bit more into um, how the author was able to get around that to some degree uh, that my enjoyment increased because it was just kind of a way of writing it that was silly. Like some of it that was coming up was just like, you know, black magic that it was talking about and all these strange things. And of course it is a horrific thing that he's talking about, but like it was written in such a way that really could have easily just been like, Oh, you know, it's just like a, what in the world? This is a weird occurrence. Why is this happening? And so like that started to become more clear. And then as it started going on, um, I did do further research when I got farther through the first part where it was like the one thing I wanted to figure out was about, you know, what is this Pontius Pilate stuff um, for? Like what's its purpose? And that's when it started getting into like the bureaucracy of various societies. And again, of like finding a creative way to, you know, have some form of, um, you know, not taking responsibility for like bringing up these ideas about Soviet rule, uh, which to me, just again, every time I kept learning about these things, it was like, this is so well done because not once in this first part did it ever feel like it was some drab affair of like, woe is us in this Soviet society it's written with such a flair, but, you know, granted, it took some looking into seeing those calls over to some of the atrocities of Soviet society. Um, it was just like incredible that a story could be written in such a way talking about something that was so horrible. Um, so I thought that those were kind of interesting to see and that it did take a while. And again, I think that even plays into that. We all had this struggle to even notice it at first. Um, is really a testament to the writing of of the novel to um, have it take this long for us to really be like, oh, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's yeah. a thing. So, yeah, and I even like didn't notice half of those things until I like read kind of like brief analyses online where I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's really it. impressive and very like he does it in such an artful way where. Like, you know, if somebody I don't know what it I don't know what it looked like, you know, for him writing this during that time. But, you know, to the point where like so, so artfully like hidden to the point where if somebody had like found his manuscript and like pointed it out and, you know, and and tried to find all of the places and point out all the places where he was being sort of like, uh, you know, treasonous against the government or something, they really wouldn't even be able to like find anything like super specific like you feel like he he couched things like very like in a very like well hidden way kind of Mm -hmm. um and especially for such like a universal subject matter too like the fact that it is about god and the devil like anybody could write about that you know it would be more pointed if it was like an animal farm situation where it's like okay well this animal is clearly (laughs) stalling you know whatever but like like, this is just something that like yeah right right but like just the fact that you're writing about something that is so universal as like the major religions of the world Mm -hmm. like that was kind of a a bold choice and a well thought out choice in the end because of that deniability Mm -hmm. um yeah one of the other things that i specifically read online that made sense to me more once I was like went back and read more of the first half um was criticisms of a lot of the like forced thought under like Soviet Russia Stalin's rule and one of that one of those things that was sort of like propagandized was a paranoia of foreigners And it talks a lot about, like, Woland is the foreigner. And a lot of their conversations at the beginning are like, oh, this fucking guy, this foreigner over here. Berlioz literally, Berlioz spends, like, the first, like, like 12 pages just, like, like, he's not even listening to Woland. He's like, oh, is he German? Is he from here? Well, he speaks all these languages, like, who is this guy and where is he from? Should I report him to the authorities? Literally, it, like, how he, does he speak Russian so well? He must be a spy. Show us your papers. Yeah, like. and then he immediately says, like, they have this, like, little meeting, he and Ivan, and then, like, they come back and they're just like, show us your papers. And it's like, I mean, it's just so, uh, I mean, 
that was a pretty telling telling part from the start i think yeah um yeah and then i also uh i took a picture of a quote that this was after i had it's like towards i don't know the middle ish of the section we read and it was after i had read some analysis online where i took a picture of this being like oh i feel like this is something um, but during, like, the absolutely incredible scene of the magic show <laughs> in the theater, oh which I we have to talk about more, but um, the cat, Behemoth, um, comes in and tears <laughs> off the MC's head, oh my God. which is the most amazing. It's so good. But the quote that I picked out was... Um, the MC cried, grabbed at the air with his hands and mumbled, give me back my head, give me back my head, take my apartment, take my pictures, only give me back my head. And I feel like that could be uh, a a veiled criticism of, again, like sort of like control of thought and control of creativity of like, you can take all of my physical possessions, but give me back like my freedom of thought. Um under this really uh, controlling rule. Um, and maybe that's me grasping at, tra- at straws, but I I liked that quote a lot of like, take all of my things, but please give me back my head. Well, especially because that's the second beheading at that point yeah. as well. So it's not like this was a one-off thing anyway. Um, that's really how we kick off the novel, which to me was just like, a huge surprise and, and again of something of like all these different things along the way to bring me up to speed of like oh this novel's really like onto something here but like bringing in this like uh more action packed um style of plot point of beheadings but yeah because of that and the way that it's talked about um with like the intellectual side of these characters especially with uh, barely Oz like I think that that's kind of a similar thing too with the way that he is um, you know that he interacts um, within that first scene but like the beheadings because it happens so much definitely feels like a tell yeah. in that direction yeah Um. well going back a little bit to you guys both already brought up Pontius Pilate but I did want to talk about the Pontius Pilate sections um, because we've had two of them thus far and uh i'll be honest i understand their purpose but they're maybe my least favorite sections to read uh and i just want to hear your thoughts a little bit i don't know if this is because i genuinely don't have that much knowledge of the bible like i know the general stories i went to church growing up but i feel i felt a little lost reading them and i think i maybe need more background information um, but I think just starting off, I want to talk, we, you guys already talked about, um, their importance in a, in a symbolic sense, but like just the, the action of reading them. How did you guys feel? What were your first thoughts? It was really interesting to read the, like the story of like the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as like a. It was like a fun novel, <laughs> like because, like I said earlier, like growing up Catholic, like every Easter, pretty much every Easter season, like the focus was on like the cruci- like the the passion of Jesus Christ, like the focus on was on Jesus getting you know sentenced and crucified and what happens the you know every minute and like I mean there's like a whole movie about it like I'm pretty sure I watched it every Easter season like a very oh, graphic brutal yeah yeah That's... no really like from like a young age like and it was really like um it was really interesting to read it like just from the perspective of Pontius Pilate too because um that's never the focus and it's just like taking a story and like flipping it on its head and looking at it from a different angle um and i i don't know i think i probably enjoyed it like more than i uh expected to um because i knew it was coming and i was like what's happening punches pilot is showing up and i have no idea like what to expect um but like being familiar being really familiar with the story from like another point of view was like 
actually it, it, it informed the way that I was like able to read this and um I I don't know I um felt like I uh I, I liked it sort of like more like as an allegory or something um uh and was able to like apply it like you said to sort of like in like a symbolic way to you know the greater like <laughs> government of the Soviet Union but um also like provided a different perspective of why you know of like the inner feel like the inner workings of Pontius Pilate's mind at the time uh because that's not the perspective that you get when you're being taught about Jesus being crucified like that's the only person that matters and um and and there is there was like almost like a historical uh nuance that was really important that like you don't get when you're sitting in church at Easter Sunday every year um so it was very informative for me (laughs) Yeah, I think uh, for that section, as far as how it like made me feel in the context of everything else, um, just to touch on something that we haven't really yet, I thought it provided a really cool contrast to where we're at in the present tense in this story, where in both instances here in Moscow, in the present, and then going back... um, to the story of Jesus's crucifixion, we're dealing with two deities, uh, but it creates such a contrast that one of them is the devil (laughs) in this one sense. And one of them is the, the person who is going to save all mankind. Like, I think it really created an interesting highlight that both of them were based around these, heavenly beings and then it created when we came back to moscow almost more of a sense of dread because you know the moral of the story of jesus's crucifixion is that it's a happy story in the end because of the resurrection and so even in the midst of all of this stuff not only has it already happened and society has progressed since then but like it kind of creates an even deeper contrast that it's like the devil's in Moscow. Like every it, time you come back, the devil's in Moscow. It just kind of like hits you harder of knowing like, oh, well, what does that mean for this story then? Like, what are we building to if what we can build to... Did he save things? Yeah. If the devil is just here. Yeah. yeah. So, so and like, the devil I thought, can say he knew Punch's pilot. And then yeah. it's just like, the question is like, well, okay, what happened? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> So, like, that all is kind of a cool thing that I really liked in the story that it was grounded in both because, like, how else could you deviate from a story where the devil is a part of it? Like, what could you go to that would hold as much attention as the devil would? And, like, what's your alternative? Jesus Christ. (laughs) You know, like, (laughs) I, I just thought that that was just kind of like... For that choice, I thought that, you know, thinking back on it, it was just kind of like, whoa, you know, of all the things to go to, not only does it like avoid any suspicions of like, how does this relate to a critique of of our culture now, but also like, how does it balance out the story as a whole? Um, So that was really cool. And then, yeah, just as far as getting the perspective of Pontius Pilate, Again, this was probably informed more with doing extra research after the fact, but just like seeing Pontius, who, you know, is enough of a main player within the story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that he's a name that people remember in the midst of like the most important event of Christianity, that like the perspective we're getting here is that Pontius is just a cog in the machine and that not even his decision at this point was something that maybe he was down to make. Yeah, he didn't have a ton of power. Yeah. Like in the end. Cuz cuz even wasn't. when they were talking about pardoning the the fourth person, mm-hmm. that wasn't even his choice. When yeah. when ultimately in this public sense, he's the one that's announcing this pardoning. Yeah. But in but in the end it has nothing to do with him and it goes all the way up to Caesar himself, you know? So like that was just an interesting thing of like again you think so much of like who sentenced Jesus to die and like you keep thinking of Pontius Pilate but then like the perspective here is it's like well it's actually not a product of Pontius's own decision it's a product of the society that he's in and their ideals so like again playing into how that is a critique of Russian society that is like 
a really interesting thing to see of of calling into question anybody's decisions of like you know what what is just in a society oftentimes just comes from the top and if the top's rotten you know where does that leave everybody else in the in the chain of command so that was like a really cool perspective there to to get him questioning and not just him making this decision of his own accord so i really liked those sections for those reason, reasons for sure yeah there i was thinking about that a lot too because um that's another thing that like is like very i don't know about other denominations of christianity but um catholics like when you read like whichever gospel that tells the story about um uh about jesus's crucifixion like um pilot there's like two characters and it's jesus and punches pilot and it's like it it like paints this sort of like 50 50 kind of like pilot was the bad one who did it and like jesus died and then like that was like that's it and they're like his name is mentioned all over the place during that <laughs> and it's in, it's crazy because um because even just like a little bit of historical nuance tells you that Pilate was a cog in like in like the machine he was just following orders and he didn't have any power and like that's not even like uh like subjective like that's just how the power structure would have been at the time anyway and so it really informs um the story like it seems like a really important detail to leave out like like yes like i mean pilot is sort of like almost like painted as as like almost like a devilish character and <laughs> yet he's like not even i mean he 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 was like in this in this case like we we see sort of like we even hear him talk like in the narrative in this narrative like he's like trying to get Jesus off almost and they're just like no like this is not the person we want to free uh and he sees the good in Jesus and you feel you feel like the helplessness that he feels and um that sympathy is nowhere to be found in the bible it's nowhere <laughs> and um yeah and that may be a denominational thing too cuz i feel like we touched on it a little bit just for background like methodist teachings of all of it like i think the pontius pilate side of it there was like some information into his hesitation but like ultimately when we get to the end of it it was still like I, I feel like a lot of the weight of the decision within those teachings does really come down to Pilate himself regardless of like the build up to it anyway because you know when you get to the Easter services or whatever else like it does get to the crux of like there's not a lot of time to elaborate just like here's the decision <laughs> Jesus died right. he rose again we're all saved but like in the build up to that story like it does play on it a little bit but like i like that that is such a focus when like that wouldn't be the crux of like the easter teachings when this is obviously such an easter centric story mm -hmm. that like that's a cool thing to like as far as a novel is concerned to like pick that part out and be like that's something that i think could play in such a significant way here yeah and it's interesting too because i um again i went to church i've read parts of the Bible I but I don't feel like I have that much knowledge on it and I don't r remember a huge focus on Pontius Pilate even at Easter services growing up or it, even because that's when it starts getting to like Judas and like the cru yeah. uh, crux of that decision of you know him, yeah, his like betrayal I, and um, that, whatnot I don't feel that I had as much knowledge about the Pontius Pilate, like his uh, role in the story. I, I knew vaguely who he was, but um, also as another like nuance to that, there is, uh, I read this on the Wikipedia page for Pontius Pilate that uh, the- <laughs> Getting these fucking primary uh, sources in The right Wikipedia now. page for Pontius <laughs> the Wikipedia Pilate. Wikipedia page. Which let's be honest, we all are <laughs> yeah, listen. on quite frequently. Um, the Ethiopian church believes uh, or views Pilate as a saint. Like, he is a, a saint in that... It's I think it's an Orthodox Christianity um, sect. But that's interesting that, like, he's viewed as such a devil in one realm of Christianity and then also could be a saint, maybe. Yeah. I feel like in a lot of denominations, it gets to the point of, like, whoever brought these events to pass, like... 
ultimately it's kind of an ends justify the means situation of like hey you may have done this but like ultimately aren't we all saved forever like that's pretty cool wasn't that what was supposed (laughs) to happen maybe that's just like such an interesting thing to yeah yeah focus on that side of it um well moving a little bit more into the uh current day in moscow um we've talked about Wolin's role a little bit as like a symbol and as how the devil and that relates to Soviet Russia. But I also want to talk about just like Woland as a character (laughs) and what he's doing here. Like, why is he in Moscow? I know what's going on and where is this leading? Because he's come in and just like absolutely wreaked havoc um, by creating loads of fake currency that changes <laughs> back and forth and by... Disappearing clothing. <laughs> yeah, I just... There's so much happening and he's got this whole entourage of the weirdest group of people. And Which a, is such a great touch. Cat. That entourage, at, like it could just be the devil, but the entourage itself is such a beautiful it's addition amazing. to like it's his very, character. It's very... um. I kept getting Alice in Wonderland vibes like this entire time, like just the cat and the weird, like there's like three weird men. One of them has a weird eye. Like there's a naked woman. There's a, there's like a, they call her a slut several times. I think they call it. It was like, she's at at various times, a slut and a hooker and, Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, some sort of like, She's just like only wearing demon. an apron. Like, and and, and uh, she's wearing some hat as yeah. well. And I think golden she's, slippers oh, once or something. She yeah. wears she wears a beret and like an apron and yeah. like she's like a, some sort of sex demon or seductive. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> I, his entourage is like extremely just like this collection of like weird characters, and it like really made me. Th- I kept thinking of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Brian compared it to anime. Well, honestly, honestly, <laughs> though, like, I, I know that you said it's just a product because obviously, hey, calling back to the recent media, but like, you know, in, in a lot of what I've even been watching, one of the things I didn't mention, it's a show, Yu Yu Hakusho, but like a lot of the arcs of anime are like, there's this one, you know, like main character that's like the evil person of the arc and you have to get to them through these layers of their henchmen for like <laughs> lack of a better word. So it just kind of Hench felt cat. like those like, like at the end of He's an episode, the main boss. Well, that's the thing. Is like at, the, at, the, at the end of the episode, you can like see Woland very large in the background, and then everybody else is in front of him. Of like, how will our heroes like get conquer <laughs> this devilish, uh, you know, whatever grouping? So like, I thought that it really had that vibe, and just like how over the top a lot of their actions are, where like it, you know, it has the anime stylings of like a lot of these evil characters have some, you know, outsized style to their evil, essentially. Like they're not just out here, like killing without saying anything. A lot of times like staple of anime, they're having these long monologues. They have all these like interesting abilities. So getting to the point where we see the troop as a whole in this theater scene in particular, mm-hmm. where they're each playing such a particular role to create this overall ambiance like was just so reminiscent of that but like I loved it because it just created something that was it feels less sinister and like that's just something that's kind of an interesting thing is like playing to your question of like why is the devil in Moscow it's not like an apocalyptic situation like that's an interesting thing of the devil is supposed to be the crux of all evil Mm -hmm. and could essentially like do whatever would be in the capacity of the all evil being. But what's he doing? He's, he's like putting on shows and like just creating general mischief and like, sure. It's like he's pranking. Yeah. Like it's some of the things are bigger because like people obviously are getting arrested for having like foreign currency or whatever. And decapitated. But but, but But like that was relatively minor. He didn't, physically do that right, like right. he he, he told, just predi- he told them it was gonna happen he yeah. just predicted it he's just like he's just like an agent of chaos throughout this entire first book and but it's like it's not like um apocalyptic harm it's just like like poltergeist kind of stuff <laughs> He's right now playing some chaotic neutral shit. Yeah. Leaning chaotic Feels very evil. Chaotic. Yeah. yeah, chaotic neutral, chaotic <laughs> Leaning evil. Leaning chaotic evil. But uh yeah, I think that that's an interesting thing that like you know, 
I'm curious to see where that goes here because while it does still, you know, as I'd mentioned, the dichotomy of like the Pontius Pilate callback and obviously the story of Jesus and then coming back to the present and seeing the devil, I, I would argue that we saw much more horrific things at that time with Pontius Pilate and the crucifixion than anything that's happened with the devil so far. And so like, I'm not really getting anything that overall is screaming like the most evil being of all time, you know, Yeah, which is an interesting part to play. I I feel like chaotic neutral is a very good descriptor for him. Like he definitely leans evil. He's not a good dude, but like definitely he doesn't seem to be like fully out to get anyone. Like even during the, um, the magic show, he just says like, I'm here to view the, Muscovites or however it says the people of Moscow yeah. like he's like I just want to see them and what they're like and this was the best opportunity to do so was to yeah. put on a show yeah. just I want to see them gathered <laughs> even uh, like at the beginning I was going to say that like the story of Punch's pilot and then like it's like sandwiched between like meeting Satan like it's so interesting because like <laughs> relatively <laughs> relatively speaking like Punch's pilot and like, you know, the, the the government as a whole at that time seems worse than, like, what we know about what Satan is doing, like, during, you know, during our first three chapters. Yeah. And it's almost like he's almost like this kind of, like, uh, like, you know, he hears that they are atheists because naturally... And he says something well, I like... I think also as a, a side note, yeah, I think you had to important. be atheist in no, Soviet right, yeah, It's Russia. like the official religion of right, Soviet Russia. Yeah, you Russia. had to yeah. be. But like he, he quote like unquote dis- religion. He, he like discovers it, like they tell him or that he asks and like he says, oh, like you're atheist. And then he says, delightful. And like, it's <laughs> like, he's like, uh, he's almost, he's like verging on sympathetic for like the first few chapters because he's kind mm-hmm. of like... This professorly, like he's very worldly. Like he, and we don't even he, know that he's fully the, like the devil. I I know that it's like no. implied, like, it's like heavily implied, but we don't like get the official word until like closer to the hundred page mark. I think like yeah, it doesn't think, get officially revealed. Isn't it the master who tells us that that's the devil? Yeah. He's like, oh well, obviously it's way, because of this, this, this. It's like two thirds of the way into the first book. Like we don't even know his name until like four chapters in. But like. At the beginning, yeah, he's we're just really, the professor for. We're really like, not a sure, like, time. who he is or what he's doing, and so it is very interesting. Like, he seems just kind of like a worldly fellow who like knows a lot of languages, and like he, I don't know, I like really enjoyed him at the beginning, and then I was like, oh, this is Satan. That's I don't know how to feel about that. Um, <laughs> but that's what's but so yeah. interesting is like yeah. the fact that you know we're getting to this point, and and you know there could even be a sympathetic view to the devil at large like I, I'm wondering what it will play <laughs> just as far as again like a lot of it is informed just from research I think a lot of us did this because like it's very apparent that there are a lot of layers to this novel and like mm-hmm. it fostered a lot of us to like go outside of the whatever requirement of the podcast and just like read the thing you know we but, did extra homework but like looking into it it's just like because of knowing what we know about the censorship of what's going on, knowing what we know about the critique of society through the stories of this novel, if this is just something to like reveal the evil that's already inherent to what's going on anyway. Like I know that a lot of it's attributed to black magic and like he's a black ma- magician according to his own, you know, st- the stylings of, you know, who he is, uh, but if that's going to be the factor or if there's more sinister motives at large. But, like, it's been enough that thus far in the first half of the book, it has been very unclear. But, like, that's a cool thing. Mm-hmm. You could easily have him come in and create terror. But, like, he's not. He's just doing enough that we're just like, what? what's he here for? Enough so that it's chaotic. <laughs> right. We're just right. like, what's going on? And, Why? And, and it's chaotic in a funny way, which is another thing yeah. that's just like such a weird, like... There's so much humor. Yeah, it's just such a strange thing to like be able to describe, again, the the crux of all evil. Having a humorous side is just a very weird thing to grapple with in the middle of this story, so... Yeah. Um... Maybe as kind of a final thought-ish, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
uh, again, the titular character, the master. Uh, he comes, <laughs> we haven't even got we're this far into it, yeah. We ha- yeah, he comes in like three fourths through this first section, maybe, or four fifths throughout the first section. <laughs> um, like it's very late. Brian and I were arguing too before we either of us had got there. He, <laughs> Brian was like, "I think Ivan's the master," and I was like, "I don't no. think we've met the no, master." No, I, I just kept coming in when Jamie was reading the book, and I'd say, "Who is the master?" <laughs> And then well, she'd say I, whatever, you, like, it's like, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Who is Margarita? His muse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I had read, like, a brief summary of the story before we started. And I was like, I don't think we meet the master for a long time. And I also know that the, that Margarita is the master's muse. That is f- from a summary. And so I was like, I really don't think we've met either of them. Um, well, And then we I finally do. <laughs> I was going to yeah, I was going to say I don't know what the uh what the translation of this chapter is for you, but when we meet him for in my edition, mm-hmm. the 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 chapter is titled Enter the Hero. Like it's yeah, very yeah, ours ours, too. It's yeah. very telling, which is interesting because like in a normal sort of like novel, you would know who the hero is and or like the the whatever, the titular character or whatever. So it's interesting to me that like we're you know 13 chapters in and like Bulgakov has to be like well hold on like I gotta remind everybody who we're actually like here to talk about because Ivan's been so focused on like that's the other Mm -hmm. thing too like the fact that there is an enter the hero chapter and it's like has nothing to do with this character who's been running around so much that like has had so much realization about what actually is going on it's not actually like the namesake of the novel is fascinating yeah I I just wanted to talk about that a little bit of like what we think how we think that the master will alter this story. Like, what is his purpose here? So far, he hasn't really done anything. Like, he's in this psychiatric hospital uh, with Ivan, and he told his story about his beloved, who I hasn't been named yet, but I think is Margarita. Um, and I, I just don't even really know, like, how he's going to fit into the story. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on, like, Maybe why he was in- introduced so late, um, or what his purpose is thus far. Um, any thoughts? Well, I think like what is interesting is that when he does come in, he appears to know somewhat what's going on, mm-hmm. as far as like he's <laughs> revealing a lot of details of like. Uh, yes, that's the devil, right, right. the man you speak of. Exactly. Things like that where, you know, a lot of the other characters that get involved up to this point don't really have any idea. Even Ivan running around and trying to describe exactly what's going on. He's still on the professor track and the mm-hmm. foreigner track and like all of these different words that he's using to describe the devil himself he can't quite get there. And the fact that the master comes in and knows that much already from the brief moment we've even seen from him, I think that like that knowledge will be interesting. And from like the research that he's done with his own, you know, writing and whatnot, I think that that will play such an interesting role of like how that interacts with um, the devil here in like how his knowledge will play into this if he has you know an understanding of like the callback story with pilot himself and like knowledge into who the devil is like is that going to be somewhat of you know the climax or showdown of the novel is that going to be necessary to even have um i just think that like somebody to clear up what's going on because again right now the the word we keep talking about is just like chaos Mm -hmm. and chaotic like to be able to put some order to it to find out like maybe what the motive is that we can finally get to that point i think that like at some point we have to know why it was so necessary for the devil to come to moscow like what what's the motivation to not be anywhere else if if that's a thing like we don't know if he can be in multiple places at once like whatever god is everywhere like (laughs) is this the same for the devil (laughs) or whatever (laughs) or whatever but he's here and we don't know why. And I think that like, that's going to be an important factor. It feels like he has more knowledge than anybody else we've met so far is what it feels like to me. 
Yeah, I agree with that. He's also the only person who like can validate Ivan at all. Poor Ivan yeah. has been like poor Ivan is what? This is where 150 in my edition pages in and Ivan has just been gaslighted around every corner <laughs> for just like for days or I don't know how long it's been, whatever. For the, the entirety of his time since he like saw his friend get beheaded by a tram uh, to like now he's in an asylum, uh, you know, for at least a day or two. And this is the only person, you know, everybody, nobody's listening to him. Nobody really understands. Like he tries to say he wants to report it to the police. And Dr. Stravinsky is like, great. All right. I'll see you in a day because they're going to bring you right back here. And he, when you start talking about Punch's pilot and, uh, and, and this, this visitor to his room, like all in the middle of the night, all of a sudden is the only person who like understands like what he's talking about. He's like, oh yes. Satan, I'm familiar with his work. And like <laughs> I, he's like I the, am familiar. <laughs> and he's like the only person who can like validate anything. So at this point he also says, um he also says uh like that, you know, we must look the facts in the face. We're both mad. But it also like in that little world, like they're both like the sanest people because like as far mm-hmm. as we know, they're the only people who have like seen the like the uh, the real reality that like we have. And so mm-hmm. I think, like, as far as we know, you know, uh, maybe this is, like, a in the first book, in the first part, um, the master's, like, appearance so late is, like, a validation of, like, um, that, we're, that we can, like, almost trust Ivan sort of as, like, a, nar- like, he's not really the narrator, but, like, as, like, a character who's telling the story, story, like, we can sort of trust that this is the reality, you know, that Satan really is here in Moscow, and, like, we know, uh, and that, you know, this this other character is here um, confirming it all, um, and also being like, oh, yes, like, I'm also here because of Punch's pilot, and um, he's a, know, he's, a love he's almost like I a, am here, too, because of Punch's <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's so, like, it's so, it, it, he acts like a, like a contrast or, like, a, a foil to Ivan's character in that way, too, because Ivan at the beginning of the novel is talking, you know, they're, the whole reason all of this has started is because they're talking about a poem that uh, Ivan wrote about um, Jesus Christ. And um, here, you know, the master is here saying, you know, back when I was like also writing a novel about Pontius Pilate. And so it's like a an interesting, um, like, um, contrast of their characters, you know, finally to get, like, it's almost like we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for like almost some sort of like, explanation and we finally get it you know 13 chapters in enter the hero (laughs) enter the hero here he is well cool guys um we can go around with just like some more final thoughts like how are you enjoying the book uh i think we're mostly all on the same page but we're we're getting to the end what are you looking forward to uh all that good stuff (laughs) uh yeah i think just getting into the second half of seeing again, that motivation and seeing if there is something more sinister at play, especially in regard to the fact that we're trying to, you know, suss out just from what we know about the novel, you know, what the critiques are of the Soviet society um, and how that actually balances out to, um, the devil, because, you know, we're not trying to critique hell. Uh, we're trying to critique Soviet Russia. And how does that kind of <laughs> and how does that balance out? You know, that's just like a really interesting question to get into um, when you have that as the contrast um, and what a contrast that is. Uh, and, yeah, I think that just getting into why this book is called the master and margarita because obviously we just got into a bit more about the master and we hear a bit about margarita but you know why have we heard so little about them um and at this point you know we saw a bit of the falling out but like margarita would presumably play a more pivotal role being named in the title of the novel itself I will say that the first chapter of part two I looked is called Margarita. Oh, there you go. So <laughs> we'll get some background so, information, so yeah, I think. So like that's going to be interesting to see how much of a role she plays. And yeah, especially hearing that, like that makes it even more exciting to get it right off the bat. But like 
there presumably is more at play here if the master himself in this present day story with Ivan is without Margarita. So, you know, what was that final break like? Again, we saw the cracks form with whatever was going on with his um, with his writing and how he had destroyed it. And that was initially what drew them together um, was actually the master's writing. Uh, but what was that final piece? Why does the master know what he knows? Um, and how does that inform um, what's going to happen with Ivan? Because I think that, you know, it's it's kind of cool that we do have such another huge player here with Ivan um, that he will also be a big part of that back half um, and that he has a story to tell and that he has a story to conclude while we still have so much more to learn and especially it being split into two distinct sections because I don't know if we specifically said this but like we stopped at the end of part one of this book and mm-hmm. it's split into two distinct parts so that'll be interesting to see that maybe Ivan takes a back seat but like he'll still have a conclusion of you know his piece here and how involved he's gotten thus far but I'm really excited for the rest of it I've been really enjoying it so far and um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for this to be quite a highlight in the pantheon of beer time with books. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, I'm absolutely enjoying this more than I thought I was going to. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that said, like when Jamie first brought this book up like months ago, I had literally never heard of it. And I could not have even told you which like genre of like, like it would even fall into. Like the title told me nothing uh, when she first like <laughs> mentioned it. And I was just like, I have no, I don't even, I don't have any idea. Um, uh, what to expect um but I mean the first thought that like struck me uh I mean at the end like right when I finished the first section was that like <clears throat> is like the title like a front <laughs> like is it just like a <laughs> is it just like a way for or almost like animal farm kind of like is it a way for like you know to like distract from like what's actually happening because like I, we didn't meet the master until like, you know, way into the first part of uh, the book. But I know, you know, we'll start off the second section um, meeting, presumably Margarita. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm curious. Like, I, I wonder I'm, I'm interested to see, like, why the book is named the way that it is, because, um, you know, we're halfway through and we don't really know why. And um, so I, I'm, I mean, like, I'm interested in that. I'm interested to to find out why Satan is in Moscow. Um uh, you know, for more than just like him being like sort of <laughs> chaos, uh, inserting himself into society. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more um, about about how like all of the creative ways that Volkov like criticizes um, Soviet society uh, in in his like really really you know clever artful way. Um, and yeah, I'm 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 really enjoying it. I. Uh, I had a really good time reading the black magic scene, especially um, where it was just like a like a crazy circus of, you know, like a chapter um, and with like all of the fake money and, you know, like the women going and changing their clothes into the provided clothes. And then like hours later, their clothes were just like disappearing off of them and causing so much chaos. And I uh, yeah, I, I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'm excited for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, and just as a quick side note, I, I do want to say one more thing for a final thought. I'm curious if the pilot sections will still be a factor in the second half because we've reached such a crux of that story. We've got to the end of the crucifixion, obviously like left on somewhat of a cliffhanger because it's like the bodies were the only two mm-hmm. left on the hill. But uh, yeah, like, that is we another thing. Learn I'm, more? Yeah, that's what I'm curious about is if there's something after that that will play into the story at large because it does feel like it could be a stopping point and like it is the end of the first half, but like is that coming back? That's something I'm looking forward to as well. Yeah, I feel like it has to come back. I don't know. I feel like with the master coming in and him also writing a story about Pontius Pilate, we'll probably hear more even if it's maybe from a different perspective. And maybe that's when the devil like gets his introduction of, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, something like maybe. I don't know. Um, I have very similar final thoughts. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I obviously am the one that picked this book and I had read a lot about it online and I know that most of the people who have read it are just absolute f- fanatics about it. Like people love this book. 
Um, and I understand why. I Brian and I uh, were talking earlier about like how Russian lit you kind of assume will be really like dreary and dreadful because Russian history is. But um, we were surprised by how absurd and funny and entertaining this novel was. Um, and I'm really looking forward to more of that. Uh, and also why The Master and Margarita was the final uh, choice for the title. I did read like background information that it went through a lot of different titles before it was published. Hmm. Um, and It'd be interesting to know what the draft titles were. A lot of them had to do more with Woland. According to the history, like one of them that, that makes sense. was brought up said... It, it um, Wolin's guest performances was an early title. Uh, I kind of so, like, <laughs> kind of like that. So, but like this was the end choice, and it clearly is important. And again, like Margarita is the first chapter in the second half, so we'll see what happens there. But I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to it. I I love the chaos. I want to know more about the Devil's Entourage. Uh, I know. I hope we do get some features on them yeah. more of like if they have a backstory because just the anime uh, <laughs> fan of me right now. I want them to just like have a whole saga. In I want to know half. everything there is to know about Behemoth the cat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm so excited. The uh, the cat that just like walks around on its hind legs and like alternates between vodka. like sitting at people's desks and drinking vodka and like calling people on the phone. <laughs> Pay, paying tolls on streetcars. Yeah. The whole uh, gamut. Well, cool guys. Thanks. Cool guys. Cool guys. Uh cool we need guys. a <laughs> We need a scat. Anybody got a Moscow inspired scat? A Moscow. It is not me. A, a Moscow. Uh, Danny did it last time, so I think it's Brian's turn. Is it me? I think I did it the time before that. I think it's Brian's so I think turn. It's I'm turn. in charge of this episode. I think it's Brian's <laughs> turn. <laughs> Uh, this, well, just as the tie-in, this, uh, I haven't made it yet, but I'm assuming that I will be making a jazzy intro for this book because we had some significant jazz scenes in, uh, in earlier in the first part. So anyway, the scat plays into that. Uh, Go for it. But before we get into that real quick, I just want to say the, the last book, because we were hitting that, like I said, we were hoping to get season two out. Uh, before the end of the year. So after The Master of Margarita, we have one more. And what's that one, Danny? Oh, yeah, we got my pick. It's Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. Oryx and Crake. So we are going to hit it on off. It. Get reading. Get started now. Uh, and homework. finish it before the end of the year. <laughs> yes, good stuff. With that, let's get scattered out of here. A do 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 ba do ba do do da ba da ba do ba boom. Wow. We will catch wow. you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.